I'm going to share some uh, thinking that I've been doing over a number of years, for about 16, 17 years now, about the issue of intergenerational mission and ministry. And I'm going to be unashamed about the theological grounding for what I'm going to propose, because my contention is that a lot of the work that churches do, a lot of the mission strategy that they formulate around generational groupings and particularly the divisions of generations um, have plausibility uh, but have questions that need to be asked from a biblical and theological point of view. So let me just get straight into some of the analysis of where we get this whole idea of generational distinction and division, the idea that we need to reach, for example, boomers and Xers and millennials and Gen Z in different ways according to different means. Fifty years or so ago, there wasn't much talk about generationally based mission in the church. Um, it was fairly rare as a concept about 50 years ago. But over the last three or four decades, it's become very much part of the discourse, not least of evangelical Christianity, to see our mission and ministry segmented according to generational distinction. So these are just some of the many, many, many books, and they're cited in the handout. I've used eight-point type to show you how many books have been published, particularly since the 1990s, but slightly also before that, uh, with titles like A Generation of Seekers, Jesus for a New Generation, Saving the Millennial Generation, A Generation Alone, Generations Together, Meet Generation Z, Winning a Generation Without the Law, and so on and so forth. It was partly out of a sort of mixed response to this welter of literature in the 90s and beyond that I sat down together with some folk that were working at the time with Matt Bird, then of Joshua Generation, now of the Cinnamon Network, which is a, um, a Christian network which links together business folk and church folk and others uh, and social entrepreneurs in the UK. And uh, we wrote this book. Actually, it says edited by David Hilborn and Matt Burr because it featured a sub-working group of the Evangelical Alliance, which actually had on it Amy Orr Ewing, who was speaking about uh, Generation uh, Z and Millennials last night, if you were in the plenary. So um, I commend that book to you. It's still available on Amazon, I think fairly cheaply, because it's been uh, out of print for a bit. But um, the good news is, I hope it's good news, I'm revising that book now. Uh, I've got a period of extended study leave coming up, sabbatical leave, and that's going to be my focus, because I feel very passionate still about this. Where do we get the concept of division between generations, needing to segment and define society according to generational groups? Has it always been around? Well, if you read the scriptures and you've got a concordance by you, you'll see that generation, the word, occurs multiple times in the Old and New Testaments. And I'll take you through some of the biblical and theological understanding of biblical generations. But in our contemporary culture, the idea that generation is something that defines a group every 20 years or so who have a different character from the group that's gone before, actually sometimes radically different character from the group that's gone before, is a relatively modern concept. When did the term generation gap get coined? Well, according to the lexicography that I've read, it's 1967. The first recorded use of the term generation gap is 1967. Uh, as you probably know, that that was the era of the summer of love, of... Uh, the baby boomer generation, so-called, born just after the Second World War, rebelling against its parents' austerity and uh, protesting against Vietnam and also uh, enjoying, if that's the right word, probably not, um, but uh, practicing the uh, fact that the pill uh, had come on stream in the early 60s, the permissive society, and so on and so forth. And around that time, the... Uh, pioneers of the church growth movement uh, on the west coast of the United States from Fuller Seminary, Donald McGavran, Charles Craft, Peter Wagner later, began to talk about the generation gap problem as a problem for the church that the church needed to address. And just as there was this, in their view, this rising generation of rebellious youth with a different worldview, uh, challenging the generation of its parents, so the church needed to get with the program.
and adapt its mission accordingly. And that was followed up, for example, in this article from 1967, March, the Crusade magazine, which was the magazine of the Evangelical Alliance at that point in the UK by David Pott, talking about uh, a generation that was drifting away from the values of uh, its parents, the values of the 1950s, the nuclear family and the traditional family unit and so on. As I say, 1967, the year of uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Beatles and hippies and uh, drug taking and the Paris riots that came through the following year in 1968 that we're commemorating this month, May 2018, the 50th anniversary of. These were all forces that led to the concept that the young were in some sense different from their elders. And Although we can argue about that kind of interpretation, and I might question some aspects of it a little bit later, there's no doubt that in the Western European context, particularly my context, and also to some extent in America too, that divergence of young people from older folk in the 60s did have a very direct correspondence in church attendance figures. Now the reasons for this are debated by missiologists, but there's no question, if you look at the statistics from my own context in the UK, they are dramatic in terms of the drop-off of youth attendance since the 60s at church. In 1960 in the UK, about 4 million people under 20 attended churches on a regular basis. By 1980, it was down to 2 million, so it had dropped by half in 20 years. By 2020, the figure will be closer to 0.2 million of under 20s in church on a regular basis. That's a drop of 95% in just over half a century. It is catastrophic. There is no question that there is a major problem. In the UK, between the ages of 15 and 19, 59% of churches have no one in that age group, 59%. By contrast, those who are over 75 comprise uh, 40% or 40% of the population over 75 do still regularly attend church in the UK. So there is a massive generation gap, if you want to use that word, around church affiliation and church attendance and it's irrefutable. Now what are we doing to try and address this? This is a graph that just shows that catastrophic drop-off particularly uh, in that um, orange sector of under 20 year olds. What's happened, at least in my context, um, uh, is that there have been initiatives taken to address that generation gap problem, so-called, uh, which are around the planting of churches oriented to young people. Uh, we have a, an initiative in the Church of England, the Methodist Church in Great Britain, called Fresh Expressions. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's very much driven by the need to enfranchise young people with cultural uh, signifiers, music, um, uh, prayer, devotional life, which is tailored, it's assumed to their socio-cultural profile um, and is not trying to do a job which is being everything to all people, being intergenerational as such. It may feed into mainline intergenerational church, but it's not the main purpose of it. My own diocese in Southern and Nottingham, its slogan is growing disciples wider, younger, deeper. And the great thing about that is it's not fixated on the younger, but the younger is right up front there as a key priority. And that reflects an emphasis which has been around for quite some time, particularly in evangelicalism. My diocese, Southern and Nottingham in England, is quite an evangelical Anglican diocese by, by tradition. David Bebbington, the great historian of British evangelicalism and indeed of world evangelicalism, calls targeting young people the grand strategy of evangelicalism. He says it's one of the distinctive things about us as evangelicals, that we have this targeted vision to enfranchise young people. And that's, there are really fantastically good reasons for that, which I'll come to. The Eastbourne Consultation on Discipleship in 1999 made a pledge to focus beginning the discipleship process as early in life as possible, recognising that large numbers of people come to faith as children and youth. And the stats do suggest 
not only in the UK but in many other nations across the world that people who make a commitment as opposed to being brought up in the Christian faith like myself they make their commitment before the age of 17 in the majority of cases where there's a firm and clear commitment other statistics suggest of course that university is a key uh, a key moment so it may take it up to 21 but let's just say that the majority of conversions do take place uh, in uh, the younger age group. I was converted when I was 15. I'm typical of that story. So there are statistics which show that there are good reasons to major on youth ministry. Um, this is just a, a chart of the fact that in my own church, the Church of England, the number of uh, vocations to stipendiary ministry have been dropping off and need to be reversed. And one of the ways that they're going to be reversed, it's thought, is to incentivize those who go into train for ministry under the age of 32. So if you're under 32 today in the Church of England, the amount of money that your college gets, and I'm a college principal, so I really am concerned about this is considerably more than if you're over 32. So there's a real attempt to focus on youth. The Scripture Union, uh, which is one of those youth organisations who have roots going right back into the Victorian era, the mid-Victorian era, era, the uh, CSSM as it was became the Scripture Union and they recently launched a campaign called the 95 campaign and that was about that 95 percent of young people in Great Britain who do not know another Christian who are under 25, the ones that are young have no contact with another Christian person uh, in any meaningful way. Amy was talking about this just last night. So that's our crisis, that's our problem and I would love to hear from you when we get to Q&A and discussion about how that's reflected in your own context across the European continent and uh, UK, um, or I'm the UK, so across the European continent and maybe elsewhere if you're coming to this conference from elsewhere. That is pretty irrefutable, the numbers are pretty compelling. The question is, given that problem, what do we do about it? You know, practically, how do we address that? And we're evangelicals here, this is an evangelical conference, so I want to say that our starting point for addressing this uh, is not uh, sociological analysis, it's not cultural studies analysis first and foremost, it must be scripture. It must be that we look at what generation means in scripture, what intergenerationality means in scripture, what generational distinctions mean in scripture, and start there. And a lot of the books that I've cited, God bless them, they do a great job on the practical analysis, but very few of them have much to do with uh, serious reflection on theology or biblical exegesis. Um, I'm going to be arrogant and claim that the book that I did in 2002 that I'm now revising tries at least to do a deeper job on the theology. One of the key things that has exercised me about addressing this generation gap issue is to do so in such a way that we don't become ageist, okay? So this may be a fairly obvious thing to say, but R.M. Butler in 1987 defined ageism as a process of systematic stereotyping of and discrimination against people because they're old, just as racism and sexism accomplish this for skin colour and gender. If we become so fixated on a distinction and division between the young and the old, it's tempting to think that um, there is uh, almost like a separate development required to use that South African apartheid phrase for, you know, the young and the old. I mean, none of us would buy into that, none of us would sign up to that, of course. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. But if we go too big on generational division and generational antipathy, which is the Kraft and McGavran phrase, uh, we could end up somewhere close to uh, an ageist, even if it's an unintentionally ageist approach to church. So just to rehearse the categories that many of you will be familiar with from all of that literature um, that I mentioned earlier, um, the classic way of construing generational difference is something around this chart. What's interesting is that the dates vary. You can read five textbooks on this and they'll give you six different date intervals for the different generational groups. But this is a rough average. The world, so let's start with the, um, the boomers. Um, because that's where the analysis tends to start. 
Uh, these are the young people who were born straight after the Second World War, who came of age uh, in the 1960s, and then were followed by a more cynical, supposedly cynical generation, Generation Xers, um, who uh, were marked by recession and unemployment uh, in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, okay, I've just dropped my microphone. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. So the narrative is that the boomers, as I've explained, were more libertarian, uh, more uh, permissive with respect to sex than their parents. Um, uh, but that hippie idealism, that, that, that sort of political utopianism that marked many of the movements of that generation uh, ran aground in the oil crisis of the 70s and the recessions at the end of the 70s and um, the realities of uh, free market economics um, in the 80s and uh, the Generation Xers uh, took a more cynical view uh, and there was a lot more divorce that they were marked by and the music got more aggressive with grunge and rap and so on and so forth. And then the millennials who were born around about 1982 came of age at the turn of the century and were, as Amy was saying last night, marked particularly by 9-11, which was a global event, which seared anxiety and a security consciousness uh, on their brain and uh, have led them into a more anxious space. And then Generation Z, just coming of age right now, who are buried in their smartphones, so the narrative goes, uh, absolutely immersed in digital technology and social media, very, very focused on presenting themselves in the best way to the world and there being a distinction between their real life and their persona, perhaps. As I say, this sociological or cultural studies analysis has driven a lot of the literature that you may have read, that I've read, certainly, uh, around generations. These are just some of the examples. So um, one of the better books on the baby boomers, reaching the baby boomers, uh, Way Clark Roof's Generation of Seekers, uh, for Generation X, Tom Bedoyne, Kevin Ford, Steve Raby have all written, uh, I think, helpful practical guides to uh, Generation Z, reaching Generation Z. And um, then the Millennials, uh, Generation 2K by Wendy Murray Zoba, uh, Frog and Amy or Ewing's reference last night, their book on Millennials, and then um, uh, Jim and Judy Ramo's book on Millennials and Mission. I don't know if any of you have read any of those or equivalents, but uh, you'll be familiar with that kind of stuff. And then now with uh, iGen, so-called, because of the uh, reliance of this generation that's emerging on smartphones uh, or, and so forth, a uh, secular book by Gene Twenge, and then James Emery White's Meet Generation Z, which is about Christian mission to Generation Z. These are helpful books. Um, they help us understand that interface between church and and world. Um, they're by turns pessimistic and optimistic, just to take uh, the Gen Z, the most recent uh, example. So Twenge uh, is very clear that whereas with Generation uh, X and the Millennials there was a discourse in the church that these folk were spiritual but not religious, so there was an innate spirituality we just needed to tap into and unlock if we could just get the strategy right. Uh, Twenge suggests that the stats are so <laughs> challenging now that actually uh, many people in so-called Gen Z are just simply not spiritual or religious. Uh, so we've got an even bigger mountain to climb and an even greater reliance on God's grace. Uh, James Emery White talks about how we're going to have to educate uh, Generation Z into not thinking that Christianity is a mainstream thing. We have to almost inure them to opprobrium and criticism from their peers, which will get even more hostile. And uh, he's kind of lining up with Rod Dreher's Benedict Option thesis, which is that we're going to exist in smaller, more kind of countercultural micro-communities um, and just exist a bit like the Benedictines did in the Dark Ages, a bit like that, although history never exactly repeats itself. Now, one of my beefs with all of this stuff is it's great um, in terms of giving cues as to strategy from time to time, but it just lacks, so often lacks, biblical and theological depth. Um, take this book, for example, Gary McIntosh. I'm not just singling out uh, this book. There are many others um, that would be similar. So this is called One Church, Four Generations. It was published about 10, 15 years ago. 
uh, Baker Book House, 250 pages long. Uh, in that book, I think there's about one page of biblical exegesis on what a generation actually is. The rest is picked off the shelf from a combination of advertisers, marketing folk, uh, cultural studies theorists, and the like. Um, similar stuff could be said about Tom Bodoin's book on Generation X and Steve Rabe's book. And they're some of the better, more biblically and theologically literate sources on all of this stuff. Now, the big problem is in generational analysis that most folk, people like George Barner, um, the analyst of church attendance in the United States. Uh, a lot of the authors of the books that I've cited draw on these two guys, okay? William Strauss and Neil Howe. And uh, their big book on this is called Generations, the History of America's Future. But they've written numerous other books and made a real career out of generational analysis, okay? So their thesis is that every 20 years or so, there's a cycle of four generations uh, through 80 years in all. And the first generation in their cycle is called idealist, and that would be the boomer generation, you know, dreaming of utopias, and you know, everybody uh, in a great peace and love, melting pot and the like. Then there's a reaction to that. There's usually a reaction against idealism. The, the exes would be the reactive, kind of Kurt Cobain, you know, angsty, uh, kind of gnarly, uh, cynical uh, upsurge against that idealism and then after that there has to be a civic generation that kind of synthesize and make the peace and, and a very into public service and, and charity and so forth and that's the millennials and Amy was describing some of that kind of generalization about millennials last night and then there's an adaptive generation which kind of just bring everything uh, into convergence and uh, take a bit of everything, but then move it along so the idealist can supercharge the next kind of cultural revolution. And that would be Gen Z, okay? The big problem with this, and you'll probably guess it if you've ever studied any history, is that history's not that neat. It really just isn't that neat. So even they start making exceptions for things like the American Civil War, the Second Great Awakening, because they don't fit the model, all right? Um, or where they see that something doesn't fit the model, they tend to just leave it out. So they're big on to the, the hippie-ishness of the 1960s, and they're big into peace and love, and uh, rock music, and all of that stuff, but less big on social protest, because that doesn't fit the idealist model exactly, okay, because by the late 60s, we're looking at quite a lot of um, quite militarized revolution. It's not idealistic, it's kind of uh, shading off in many cases into terrorism and hijacking and stuff like that, the Bader meinhof gang and the Black September gang of the 70s. And it's deeply American. No, apologies to any Americans here, but Howe and Strauss are, are just totally immersed in the American story, but they don't make accommodation for Poland or Hungary or even Britain, really. And yet this is the, this is the model that's driven so much of the Christian uh, publishing on this subject. Now, I think, again, we need to get very clear about where this stuff is coming from. Because Howe and Strauss systematise generational theory massively, but they in turn are dependent particularly on a whole history of generational analysis in marketing and advertising that goes back to the late 1950s. Now, this is where doing a bit of research can help. Back in 1957, Eugene Gilbert, an American uh, market analyst, wrote a book called Advertising and Marketing to Young People. And that became an absolute classic in Madison Avenue. If every, every, anybody's seen Mad Men, the American series Mad Men, about advertising, it's one of my favorite series of all time. Uh, fascinated by advertising. Um, but this was a book not written for Christians. This was a book written for marketing people. And what... Eugene Gilbert saw was that in that sort of post-war economic recovery, and America, of course, hadn't been devastated by the Second World War quite like Europe was. Um, so that was the seedbed of this. Um, there was a whole target market. He called it a target market of, of children, uh, sort of high school age, um, teenage uh, children, uh, who would benefit from having their own music, their own fashion, their own cosmetics, their own dress sense, and their own films and radio stations and so forth. And although Elvis Presley is fantastic, 
I don't think it's a mistake or an accident that rock music, rock and roll surged up at that time. You know, a young icon uh, from the deep south who melds blues music and country music and R&B and suddenly becomes a massive hit. Um, ten years before, maybe not. It was the right cultural moment because there was this emerging generation of teenagers in the right moment in history that were susceptible to marketing as a target market of their own. Fashion went the same way, films, James Dean, Marlon Brando and so forth. Showing my age, I mean, I'm, I'm not as, as old as to remember that when it first came round, but, but it, I was born in 1964, so this was still in my parents' memory and they tell me stories about that stuff, you know, and the impact of Elvis on my mother and all that stuff. And you think that just fell from the sky and maybe it sort of did, but it was also very, very much around that socio-cultural moment. And in Life magazine in 1959, they took Gilbert's research and wrote it up. And this is the headline. This is from August 1959. A new £10 billion pound power, the US teenage consumer. Okay. So you get where, where that's coming from. There wasn't really a thing called a teenager before then. Now we take it for granted, and, and the teenager be it becomes the sort of lead, rising generational group, which defines the next of those cycles that I've talked about. And actually, people like Graham Coddington and Anne Fishman build tremendously on this analysis and you know, have global corporations that speak to big business, Apple, Google, whatever, about generational difference and consult uh, on that level. Actually, Codrington, Graham Codrington started off writing about this from the perspective of youth ministry. He was a youth minister in a church and uh, did his master's thesis, which I read, uh, on youth ministry and generational difference. And he's now kind of morphed into this, this guru, marketing guru, which is a fascinating story. Anyway, Graham Cray, there's the uh, headline blown up. So Graham Cray, who's uh, an Anglican theologian, um, has said, the sociological study of generations is of value, but we need to remember that its primary application has been as a consumer marketing tool. So we do need to ask some serious theological questions about what a generation is in relation to what How and Strauss say it is. So let me get on to that. In the book, and it is a, you know, it's a fairly sort of academic book, there are nine different different definitions of what a generation is. So we're going to skip over that because we haven't got time to go into all of that. Okay, so I'm going to simplify it. So I'm trying to bring biblical and theological synthesis to this subject around the sociological and cultural analysis. And what I want to say is that biblically, and we can apply this to culture, I think in a more profound way than some of the stuff I've mentioned, uh, we see that generation is defined by kinship, by age, by social events, and by worldview. Okay, so this is, this is the big takeaway. This is, if you're going to make notes or highlight on the high end out that I've given you, this is probably what you want to highlight. Kinship. Well, we all know about those genealogies in Scripture, don't we? Let's be honest, when we were theological students or as pastors or as lay people, uh, we get to the genealogies and uh, if we have to study them, we will, uh, or read them, we will, uh, but we tend to sort of skip over them. But for this subject, they're very important. In scripture, for the most part, genea or dor, the Hebrew word uh, that we translate generation, basically means the interval between two levels of a family tree. To put it more specifically, the interval between a father and the firstborn son. Okay, the interval of, of years. And we know from the patriarchs that that could be about 100 years of age in Abraham's case. Um, but Typically, uh, it would be in, in the biblical, in the ancient world, it would be sort of 15 to 20 years because people would have children pretty soon after puberty. So when you see about curses that go down to the third and fourth generation, or when in Ezra 9, the instruction is not to intermarry for nine to ten generations, uh, that's about family, it's about kinship, it's about those levels of the family tree, simple as. And then there's age. You know the way in which um, sometimes, so that would be the, the, the kinship, just some images of kinship, mother and daughter, grandmother and daughter. That's a big, big thing in, in scripture, obviously, family relationships and kinship relationships. And then there's age, sheer 
chronological age. In Luke 3.23, we learn that Jesus was about 30 years of age when he began his public ministry in Luke. Um, and uh, we, we think, don't we, often of uh, generational identity uh, around sheer chronological age. So there was this series in the 1990s, I don't know if anybody remembers, it called 30-something. It was about yuppies, effectively, in the United States, young urban professionals, all of whom are around 30 years of age. Uh, they would have been, uh, basically, uh, the back end of the baby boomers, okay? Slightly more anxious, perhaps, than, than the younger end of the baby boomers. Um, but we think about the 60s generation. So we tag it to a particular date in the calendar or a birth year, and we say that defines the beginning of or the middle of a generation. And there's echoes of that uh, in Scripture. So in Exodus 28, um, the uh, term that's used to translate date of birth um, is linked to the concept of uh, generation there. So you can kind of date a generation from a particular point in the calendar. But that in and of itself is really just arbitrary if you think about it because people are born every second of every minute of every year. So what leads us to slice the calendar in particular ways and say, well, that's generation X who began in 1964 and ended in what 1982 why why do we why do we segment the calendar like that when people are born all the time it can't just be about chronological age or even just kinship because you know people family trees will be tagged to chronology in all sorts of different ways we've got to anchor it somehow and the way we anchor it is that third criterion of social events so in our discourse, we talk very freely, don't we, about the, well, you can hear it said in America particularly about the, gener uh, the Vietnam generation. Or you can sometimes hear about the baby boomer generation, which is tagged to a particular moment in history, a particular event, which was the swelling of the birth rate as servicemen came home from the front and uh, families swelled in number. Okay, so there's a particular event in history that defines generation. Uh, the falling of the Twin Towers is one of the things that defines millennials. You know, it happened at the millennium in 2001 or around the millennium, and it becomes a millennial event. And there's the echo of millennialism in theology and apocalypse and all of that around that. So social events are really important, and we see this in Scripture too. So Jesus in Mark 13 uh, talks about this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. And what's he talking about there? What, what's, what's the big thing that's looming in his mind? It's, some scholars would say it's the fall of the Jerusalem temple he's got in mind. Others would say he's also got in mind the end time, you know, the eschaton, the apocalypse at the end of the age. But he's tagging it to a moment in history where the Romans are oppressing the Jews and the Jews are under the cosh, and something big is around the corner, okay, that's going to threaten the temple. And it defines the generation, so he says, this generation won't pass away till that, that has happened. And then finally, of course, there is worldview. So we talk about generation in terms of their psyche and their outlook on philosophy and morals. So uh, for a drug-addled Gen X cohort, we sometimes call them the chemical generation because of their reliance on Prozac and antidepressants and so forth. Uh, the beat generation was a term that was used for the um, generation that came before the baby boomers, the radical kind of beatnik generation. That wasn't about chronology, it wasn't about social events, it wasn't about kinship, it was about an attitude, an outlook on life, a world view. And Jesus will talk, won't he, frequently in the Gospels about the mood or the psyche of a generation. He calls his own generation evil, corrupt, wicked, um, and the like. So there is this, this attitudinal approach. He's often very negative about uh, the worldview of the generation of his own age. But here's the thing, folks. When he talks about generation in all of those negative texts with respect to worldview, it's almost always negative. Most of the metaphors, most of the adjectives he used to describe his generation, they're negative. But he's also talking about everybody who's alive at the time. He doesn't say, he's, he's, he never segments. 
generational groups like we do. He just talks about basically everybody who's living in his own age needs to watch out for what's going to happen. Where there is distinction in scripture, which is more akin to what Amy was talking about last night, um, it's not so much just um, in relation to this grid, it's more in relation to the distinction between youth and age. So let me just talk a little bit about the biblical, uh, biblical material on the difference between young and old people. That's the right slide there. If we're going to talk about generational distinctions and differences in Scripture, the most we can say is that Scripture segments young and old. There ain't any teenagers, there aren't any adolescents, um, there's youth and there's age, there's infancy, children are recognised as well, okay? But um, in terms of kind of sociological impact, it's young and old, that's what you've got. So in Psalm 92, long life is a blessing from God. Uh, Jacob profoundly loves his sons to the very end of his days in Genesis 49. Uh, Barzillai supports David during Absalom's result with all, uh, revolt with all his wisdom and experience born of age. Simeon and Anna are full of joy when they welcome the infant Jesus uh, at the temple, at the presentation of the temple at the evening of their lives. Uh, so age is equated very frequently with wisdom, uh, with experience, and with godliness. Not always, of course. You can have foolish older people. Saul, very foolish, as we've been hearing, in relation to David, who's younger. Although David could be very foolish, as we heard this morning as well. But to be young was also a good thing. To find oneself at the flourishing point of life, Christ in a virtuous light, whether it's in Zechariah 9, 16 to 17, where the vitality of young people is a sign of Israel's redemption, or in Titus 2, 6, where the formation of young people is shown as essential for a thriving church, or in 1 Timothy 4, where Paul instructs the emerging leader, Timothy, not to let anybody look down on him because he's young. That is all venerating age, but also recognising the vigour and the strength and the importance of youth. But this is where I get to my main sort of point, and this is where I want to lead into the core message for today. As well as recognising the vigour and the energy and the vision of youth, as well as venerating age, the core message of scripture in the providence of God is that young and old are to be one. One in God and latterly one in Christ. This is the ultimate purpose of God's mission on earth. To bring young and old together. To glorify him and to bring peace and reconciliation. And to draw others to, to God, of course, in faith. Deuteronomy 28.50 is a signature text for what I want to say. Um, in that text, God warns, or Moses, God through Moses warns Israel about the dire consequences of disobeying his law. God will send a foreign nation, says the text, who will swoop down on you like an eagle, a merciless nation whose immorality will be plainly evident in its wanton failure to, and this is the quote, its failure to respect the old and favour the young. Different translations put it differently, but fundamentally that's the message. If you're going to make an alliance with a foreign power, be sure that it is a foreign power that does not divide its people generally, but particularly make a division between the old and the young. If you are going to link up with anybody who does not both respect the old and favour the young, says that text, forget it. It will be a doomed alliance. So the core message there is that too sharp a division culturally or theologically between the young and the old is bad news. Bad news. Now Karl Mannheim, Hungarian sociologist, is one of the great academic uh, figures that lies behind a lot of the generational analysis that I talked about. How and Strauss are in some sense a very, very uh, popularised version of Mannheim's work that was uh, first translated 
into English in the 1950s, but goes back to the 20s. Now, Mannheim did say that the so-called lead or rising generation of younger people in a society will tend to be the change makers, the ones whose flexibility of thought and openness to new ideas will push society forward, technologically, philosophically, whatever. Um, and that's an important point. And it sort of links with what I said about those who are under, say, 25 being the most open to the gospel. Most conversions happen among those younger people. But here's the thing too. Mannheim made it very clear that the cooperation of the young and the old would be a compensating factor, as he put it, for undue antipathy between those two groups. And that, it seems to me, resonates with the message of Scripture deeply. Another thing that is worth noting against, I think, Howen Strauss's over-systematised view of generations, is that the next generation that follows after a generation that might have been progressive and radical might well be more conservative. Now, they sort of do allow for that, but they over-programmatise it, as I say. Uh, in uh, Britain, there was a comedy series a while ago called Absolutely Fabulous. Not a very good picture of it, but the joke in the series was that uh, Adina, the mother, was a wild child from the 60s, a baby boomer who still lived like, you know, she was a, on a hippie commune or something. Her daughter, Safi, late teens, was much more conservative, as you can just see the dress style, okay? So the joke was that the, the younger generation was more conservative than the older one, and that is possible too, and it may be even that that gives us uh, hope. Now, I'm not saying conservatism is all good, um, but in terms, say, of sexual morality, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is on a downward curve towards disaster. Historically, there have been generations that have recovered moral sensibility as compared with the previous one. Again, I'm drawing on my own context, but in Britain, the evidence seems to suggest that at least in public life, the late 18th century was not a good place to be. There were gym palaces, prostitution was rife, venereal disease. In the Victorian era, Whatever went on behind closed doors, and that's a matter of great speculation for historians, in public life there was a recovery of um, uh, moral rectitude and uh, actually from a Christian perspective there were folk like Shaftesbury and Wilberforce and uh, latterly the Booths who recovered social morality as well in that era. So let's not assume that um, uh, if we're going to buy into this concept of generations or even just youth and age being different that necessarily the younger generation will be uh, worse in terms of Christian commitment than the older one. There is hope folks, there is revival, it happens, renewal happens and very frequently it is the young who lead it. One of our problems is that that whole church growth movement um, are, that originated in the States in the 1970s that bought into that generational analysis that I've been talking about um, also extended their understanding into something called the homogeneous unit principle. Does anybody know what that is? It's basically the idea that people like in church as well as the rest of society to cluster together with folk of their same profile, socially, culturally, economically, class-wise, race-wise, and so forth. And basically, being arch-pragmatists, evangelicals, but pragmatists, they said churches that grow tend to be churches where people are pretty much the same. And this thinking, the homogeneous unit principle thinking that they pioneered has fed into, to some extent, to the old idea that youth church and youth ministry needs to be segmented and distinguished from mainline intergenerational church. That's been, that's been a big driver of a lot of that literature I mentioned earlier. The problem with it is that if you are only looking at age, and when a lot of people in the church talk about generation, they don't mean all the other stuff that I've been talking about. They sort of think, they sort of do, but what they mean in their own explicit analysis is under 20-somethings, or people between 20 and 40, or people over 40. Um, and occasionally you get references to things like 9-11 and, and, and cultural technological change around smartphones, which kind of does play into my grid about, you know, worldview, social events, whatever. 
but fundamentally a lot of people just tag it to age and I want to say actually age is not the whole deal I'll give you an example Prince Harry who's a member of our royal family you're probably aware even if you don't come from <laughs> my part of the world that there was a royal wedding this weekend um, he's 33 okay and he's a millennial according to the analysis because he's 33 but so is a single mother on a sink estate in the east end of London with three children from three different fathers who's living on benefits, state benefits, um, and hasn't got a penny to rub together and wonders where the next meal's coming from. She's a millennial too. Now what's more important, the fact they're both millennials, that they're both 33, or are there some other stuff that we should be taking account of as Christians? I think the other stuff, economics, uh, marital status, sexual morality, um, class, they're probably more important for us in our mission to that woman than saying, oh, you're a millennial, therefore I need to evangelise you the same way, I need to pass you the same way as I would Prince Harry. Do you get my point? Sociologists use the word intersectionality to talk about a complex model of understanding who people are in society. And I think biblically, as I've shown, we've got a mandate for being sensitive to those dynamics as well as just saying, how old is somebody? Oh, they're 33, therefore we've got a strategy for 33-year-olds or millennials, okay? So I'm not saying that generational mission and ministry don't have coherence. They have a place. Generation is a biblical concept, but it's a nuanced and rich concept. And please, 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 let's not just make it all about age groups. The Evangelical Alliance UK, I chair its Theological Commission, published a report called 21st Century Evangelicals just a few years, a couple of years ago. And what was fascinating about that was that they broke up the analysis um, by uh, ethnic groups. So they asked the same questions of white young evangelicals. These were young evangelicals, uh, under 25 I think it was. Um, who uh, answered in particular ways, and then black and ethnic minority evangelicals who answered the same questions. And what was remarkable was that um, black and ethnic minorities, for example, said that they rarely or ever doubted their faith in twice as many number, or, uh, twice as many of them said they rarely if ever doubted their faith compared with white British millennial evangelicals. And these were young people who identified as evangelicals. 34% of black and ethnic minority evangelicals never doubted their faith. 17% um, said that they never did if they were white. Um, black and ethnic minority evangelicals said um, evolution and Christianity were incompatible in 49% of cases, whereas just 11% of white British evangelical millennials thought that um, the uh, uh, narrative of Genesis 1 to 3 uh, was not compatible with the theory of evolution. The tithing of black and ethnic minority evangelicals was considerably greater than the tithing of, of white minority, white, white millennial evangelicals. And so it goes on, okay? So stereotyping is problematic. We need a more nuanced analysis. How many people do you think, under the age of 24, voted for Donald Trump? Who voted? Just give us a guess. In America. Oh, it's on the outline. Sorry. That's a trick I use when I don't give an outline out. Thanks for rumbling me. It's 34%. But here's the even more remarkable thing. When President Nixon, Richard Nixon, Tricky Dicky, of Watergate infamy, was voted in in 1968, 38% of people under 30 voted for him. This is the height of hippie, peace and love America. 38% nonetheless voted for Richard Nixon, who was the antithesis of uh, all that stuff and uh, campaigned against it. So if you look online and um, look at a video uh, put together by Adam Conover. Um, Adam uh, Ruins Everything is the, the video series. He has a TV channel on YouTube uh, where he kind of debunks popular myths. He actually has a, a video called Millennials Don't Exist, which is quite amusing. I mean, it totally, totally goes to the extreme. I mean, it's, it's totally over the top. 
I don't agree with, you know, he's being a cartoon figure here. But he's kind of pointing out the absurdity of massive generalizations about people just because they happen to have been born between two dates in the calendar and how different millennials are and how much actually one of the features of millennials is not being stereotyped. They don't like being stereotyped into boxes. Um, I mean, let's face it. If millennials really are everyone aged sort of 15 to 39, something like that, across the world today, that's two billion people. Two billion people that we're trying to generalise about. And, I mean, when we get into other continents like Africa and uh, Asia, I mean, this is a Western analysis, by the way. So, you know, we need to bear that in mind. Generational analysis is Western-based. Uh, and, and that's something to bear in mind for world mission as well. Um, so I could go on. But the point is that there is an emerging literature, which I'm so pleased about, which I've cited in the handout, of intergenerational mission and ministry, uh, theology and practice. Uh, good examples which, you know, kind of draw on my passion for intergenerationality uh, would be um, Howard Van Der Vel's The Church of All Ages, 2008, Rachel Muir's Living for the Future, 2008, and Holly Catterson Allen and Christine Lawton Ross's Intergenerational Christian Formation. If you're going to read one book, which is a great mix of theological reflection and practical advice on this, this would be the one to go for, in my view. It's published by IVP America. It's a collection of um, really great articles uh, on this subject, and I commend it really warmly to you. Let me just pick out, as I finish, and we open up a discussion about this. Let me just pick out a few practical uh, pointers from these books uh, about how we might do this in church, how we might land this stuff, because this is where I want to turn it over to you, because you'll have experience of this as well as I do. They suggest um, that the model that we can draw on time and again uh, is the model of the family, the intergenerational family, not just mothers and uh, daughters, fathers and sons, but grandparents, great-grandparents. Um, scripturally, this is the building block of the people of God. This is the building block of the church. Uh, single people are included uh, because the church is intergenerational unit. Its family unit includes, of course, many who are not biologically part of that household. Household churches in the New Testament were not just about biological kinship. They involved freed men, they involved slaves, I mean obviously that wouldn't be hopefully relevant today, although slavery is a modern problem, um, and, and cousins and, and, and friends and all sorts, adoptees. So intergenerationality is at the absolute core of church, they argue, and here's some ways in which we can enfranchise young people. When a church is putting together a mission statement, how about consulting younger people on the wording of that and including a commitment explicitly to uh, enfranchise young people in the life of the church. What about young people on leadership teams? What about young people on church committees? Not as token gestures but genu genuinely hearing their voice in the decision making that we, that we put together. Uh, all age worship is often, too often, adults speaking to children in a slightly simpler way than they would do in the normal adult congregation. Um, uh, what about if children led the worship? What about if children read the scripture? What about even if children and young people were encouraged to preach, as I was as a teenager in my church? Um, and you can judge whether that was a good decision or not, <laughs> according to where I've ended up. Um, evangelism. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, covenant renewal in De Deuteronomy uh, 29 and Joshua 8 explicitly features children, festivity in public, witness to the covenant uh, explicitly features children. And the women and little ones and aliens resided among them and were part of that in Joshua 8. So our witness in public, uh, in evangelism, can visibly involve children. Our drama and dance activity, communion service can be children, um, processions and pilgrimages, prayer leading and uh, testimony can be offered by young people. 
And another way in which we can instantiate this even more long term, I think, is if you're going to be on an eldership or a senior leadership of a church, how about making it a commitment of that role that you will mentor a younger person, that there will be an expectation that you will do that. Not everybody is gifted in that area, but it will making that a core activity, an intergenerational commitment that will land this stuff. If you want a more critical reflection on all of that homogeneous unit stuff, I point you to this Lausanne Covenant paper from the mid-70s, which was the beginning of rethinking that really hard segmenting of generational distinctions, the Pasadena Consultation on the Homogeneous Unit. And Peter Wagner, who was one of the great sort of leaders of the HUP, he revised his opinion and said, OK, if we're going after generational groups and targeting them, that can only be an interim strategy, an interim ethic. The ultimate is to model what we will be together in the new heaven, new earth, which is an intergenerational church worshipping around the throne of Christ. OK. Although, interestingly, in Revelation, elders are still called elders, but let's not, let's not get into that. That's, that's just, um, that blows my mind. But anyway, you get my point. It can only ever be an interim strategy. So if there's a youth church, if there's a youth ministry, praise God, that can be fantastic to meet that deficit that I've talked about. But for goodness sake, may its trajectory be integration. We are one body in Christ. Okay, we're not, the body is not to be segmented according to youth and age. Finally, just a picture of what I'm talking about, the presentation of Christ in the temple. There we have it. I've mentioned it already in Luke's Gospel. Simeon and Anna are at the very end of their life, part of this great celebration of God. A middle-aged man, possibly, we don't know how old Joseph was, but he seems to have been dead by the time of Jesus' crucifixion. So let's assume he was a bit older than Mary. Mary, a teenage mother, almost certainly a young woman. And then the infant Jesus. This, my friends, I'd say is a picture of the church as God wants it to be and as it will be in his ultimate purposes. 